Hello, everybody. Welcome again to the Watchlist Podcast. I'm your host, Jacob Boyer. I'm joined today by Heather Hamilton. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm pretty good. That's good. So, that redundant, much redundant. Uh, so, Heather is a uh, junior at Kutztown University, where I went uh, in the same major. Uh, and we're here to talk about uh, representation in film, namely the... Uh, the aspect of women being represented in film and I was very much inspired when I first had the idea to do this podcast I had seen you were in a panel for uh, NBS at uh, Kutztown the National Broadcasting Society and you did a uh, uh, a panel to discussing topics like that with uh, a classmate of a former classmate of mine Celine I might want to have her on at some point so I Celine if you're watching this yeah she definitely has some hot takes uh, so yeah I just thought man that would be a really good uh, discussion to have because I really liked the way that you two kind of uh, shared your opinions. It was very uh, informative and a lot of it was from aspects that I wouldn't even consider. So yeah, I really enjoyed that uh, that conversation uh, that you guys had with that crowd and uh, I was really happy that you decided you wanted to come on uh, to the show to no, yeah. sort of expand upon those thoughts. So, But before we get into that, uh, let's kind of go over who you are a little bit more. So uh, like I said, we both went to Cutstown. You're still currently there. Yep. Uh, what made you decide that you wanted to get involved in media? So, I mean, I had always heard a lot, you know, when you're younger, how people don't really know what they want to do when they're older and they change it and they change their major, which is totally fine. But my freshman year of high school, I took a journalism and mass media class, um, and the teacher of that class ended up becoming my mentor for my entire tenure in high school. But after, at the end of that class, we had a final project that I think it had to be a video or maybe you had an option, I don't really remember. So I'd written a script, horrible script. <laughs> as, um, as all our first scripts yeah. are. <laughs> I'd written a script, got a, I got a little cast together, didn't get a crew. I was my one person mm. crew. Again, as all first projects yep. are. <laughs> with my, with, with no audio, just my, my sister's, uh, old DSLR. It was, a the original Canon Rebel. Mm. Um, and I recorded it and I went in and I edited it and I had such a good time doing it that I started to think that maybe that's what I had wanted to do. Mm. But back then I was quite I was quite timid and quite shy, didn't talk a lot, didn't... The, the thought of being around a camera made me shake. Mm. So it was something that I was like, eh, this, this, is, this is never really going to come to fruition. So my high school had a news program that was a class, and I had decided to just, to just do it and just rip the Band-Aid off and go ahead and do it. And every morning... Um, each person would have kind of like rotating positions of like the floor manager and like the assistant director and you could be the talent and everything and eventually I did get on camera and mm. got over it but I really learned how much I loved working behind the camera and I had just decided that that was 100% what I wanted to do and I'd heard so much about Kutztown's film program and I kind of like as soon as I was accepted there I just went straight for it I didn't really I applied to other places, but I knew that it's just what I wanted to do, and I don't regret it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's funny. That's uh, that's kind of mirrors my background a little bit. I was sort of the same way where I figured out I, – I, a friend of mine showed me YouTube back in, uh, I want to say, maybe like 7th or 8th grade, and I started watching stuff like The Angry Video Game Nerd or The Nostalgia Critic, and I was like, yeah, that's what I want to do. Because I, I, I knew that I wanted to be, like, in some sort of creative field. I would draw a lot. I would write a lot. But then when I saw, like, how accessible stuff like YouTube and content creation was, I was like, oh, man, that's something that I could do. So, it was, yeah, like you said, it's a lot of, like, just low budget, like, no audio equipment and no lighting equipment, just one camera with your, like friends after school and that's that's always the start of something special oh yeah absolutely i mean there was plenty there's plenty of times once i end up did end up getting into it where i don't know where those videos are now but like we did like a we did a parody of like the blair witch and it was so oh, stupid no. <laughs> it was so stupid and mm. it's it's just so funny to look back on now when you're using all of this this equipment that we're surrounded by right now right whereas like if you did something like this when you were like 15 it would just be like 
we're just gonna record this on my phone and hope mm-hmm. for the best. Yeah, and it's almost weird how it's like come like you know like full circle in a way where now you have like big productions that are just made on iPhones. So it's almost like what was all that work for? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, yeah it, it it's always like it's just such a unique way to like figure out this is what I want to do and like like develop that over the years. And like you touched on. The one thing I, I like what you said is that uh, you, we look back on those things or, that we've made and we're like, oh, that's so terrible. But, like, imagine what we're going to think, like, ten years from now. Like, looking back on what we're doing in this moment, like, that's going to be such a surreal thing. Like, Steven Spielberg probably hates Jaws. Oh, like, I'm sure. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, that's such, like, it's a weird thing to think about, but it's just, like, that weird kind of perspective that uh, you get with time. Especially because you're always your own critic and you want to look back and you're like, I could have done this better, but mm-hmm. in the moment that was where your skill set is and you can really do nothing but grow and learn right. more. Right. Yeah, it's like that quote um with Ira Glass said where it's like when you're starting out in anything create I this is like the third time I've <laughs> mentioned this quote on a podcast but it's like any time that you uh, are doing anything creative you have a threshold for what you think uh is quality no matter what you're doing whether it's like writing a song or painting or making movies and you're never ever going to be able to meet that threshold in your own eyes, especially starting out. So it's important to realize that uh, you're going to have limitations and that you have to keep on building to get where you want to be. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. So, uh, sort of going off of that, let's let's talk. So we we talked a little bit before the uh, the show. We were looking at my huge movie collection that's <laughs> off screen. Uh, what what are some of your favorite movies or movies that have really inspired you? Oh, boy. All right. To, like, um, shape you into the filmmaker you are today. So, I mean, one of my one of my top movies has always, always been Jurassic Park, mm. which, I mean, have you met a film major? I feel like it's always, it's always <laughs> exactly. up there for them. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but I'm a big fan of... I promise I have movies that aren't all blockbusters, but um, <laughs> I'm a big fan of Kill Bill. Mm. Huge fan. I was just watching it the other day. And I'm also a big fan of Pulp Fiction. Um, But besides those, um, man, that's tough. I have quite an interesting (laughs) list of movies. I mean, I'm actually, this isn't, you know, I mean, a, the typical movie, but I'm actually a huge fan of animated movies as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm a big fan of How to Train Your Dragon, actually. Okay. I think it's, all three of them, I just think they do a great job at narrative storytelling and everything. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, but sorry, I'm like looking at my letterbox trying to get some ideas. By all means, yeah. Um, but I'm a big fan of, I mean, I told you right before we started that I recently got into Star Wars. Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't know if they'd be one of my favorite movies, but they're some of the favorite movies for me to watch kind of in my, kind of like that background noise kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of the John Wick movies. Okay, yeah, yeah, those um, are good. Went and saw the the newest one in theaters, really good. Um, it's so tough. I, I have quite a few, <laughs> and it's... Um, oh, you know what? I actually, I can give you my all-time favorite movie. Okay. It's, it's Fight Club. All right, yeah. That's, I, I, yeah, that's a good one. That's, that's a good one pick. of my all-time favorite movies. But I have a couple that are a little bit more... Maybe not the usual... The usual quality, we'll say, mm-hmm. is... Um, I love Dazed and Confused... Okay. That's that's a kind of a nostalgic movie for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a big fan of Donnie Darko. Um, I have to admit, I'm a big fan of the Harry Potter series. I mean, I came in I came in here with a Harry Potter scarf on, so I can't <laughs> even deny that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, but um, I'm also I love Living in Oblivion. That's always I don't I haven't heard of that one. It's a, it's a, it's a it's a Steve Buscemi movie actually. He's the main character. It's from 1995 and it's actually Oh, is that the one where he's like a making a movie? Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. Mm-hmm. I have heard. I haven't seen that, but I, Good yeah, one. I, I, I definitely know what that one is, I yeah. definitely recommend it. I'll um, have to check that one out someday. And then I'm going to I'm going to finish it off with Buffalo 66. Okay. I, I I don't think I know that one either. What's that one about? So that one is it's a Vincent Gallo movie. And it's, it, man, that's hard to explain. It's, <laughs> that's always a good sign when uh, <laughs> you're like, oh man, it's really hard to explain why I like this. One. It's, that's that. It's a sign that it's great. It's it has Christina Ricci in it. Um, it's it's about this man that he has always essentially disappointed his parents. Mm-hmm. Not even they just don't like him really. And mm-hmm. he kidnaps a woman 
to try and kind of make up for his sad life. Okay. And he tries to kind of... I don't want to... It's so hard to explain. It's it's very interesting. I don't want to call it a psychological movie. It's just that when you watch it, it's watching this man's insanity make so much sense to him, mm-hmm. but not to the viewer. Right. Um, it was shot entirely on film, and it has one of the most insane scenes to ever be used with film i would definitely recommend it Mm. it's actually one of professor johnston's favorite movies okay if that gives you any yeah yeah (laughs) he uh yeah we i definitely got a lot of my not like up like top 10 favorites but he that 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 class uh masterpieces in film history i got a lot of really good uh recommendations out of that class he'd be fun to have on this show i might have to reach out to him so it's interesting You, you 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 touched a little bit on like there's movies that you Hold that you that there's no question about it like definitely like top 10 top 5 whatever but there's also those movies that kind of are more like loosey goosey where you know you really really like them but they're not like you wouldn't they're not your go to's I think that favorite movies oftentimes fall on a scale of like objectivity versus subjectivity where you can say like objectively Star Wars yeah it, 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 it tells a coherent story from A to B and it's entertaining but it doesn't really necessarily have a lot of those aspects that make like your favorite movie your favorite movie you know what I mean like Fight yes. Club is, I think is a very subjectively very entertaining movie but it also way further excels um, at what it's trying to do than like your Star Wars or your Jurassic Park where like the main point is to be entertaining for sure. I mean, yeah, I would clump those like like Harry Potter and Star Wars together for me because I mean, I can't even necessarily call them nostalgic movies because I got into both of those at a pretty a- late age, excuse me. <laughs> um right. but like when it comes to like I'm a person that's very into the lore of series, like learning about things that they don't necessarily talk about in the movies and Mm -hmm. harry potter and star wars are the perfect perfect explanation Mm -hmm. for that because you could just you'll never know every single thing about them and that's probably why i say like oh like i'll put them up there they're not my favorite in terms of narrative per se but they keep my interest they're they're i don't want to call them a classic but they're kind they're just that classic you can put them on in the background Uh, yeah kind of movie but they're, they're nonetheless good because I don't necessarily want to say that a, for a movie to be amazing, it has to be narrative driven. It really doesn't have to be necessarily. Mm-hmm. I think, yeah, we're definitely locked into uh, this idea that like movies are a certain way from A to B and like you kind of have to be uh, very strict about what you do with them to make like a coherent digestible product for audiences but there's there's so many unique ways that you can use an hour and a half of film to really tell something compelling or show something to the audience to like make them think so it's yeah it's always um those movies definitely have their place but it's uh it's it's always good to experience something like new you know what i mean yeah there's there's definitely movies that are maybe more more for fun, mm-hmm. I want to say. I mean, like I mentioned the John Wick movies. I don't necessarily want to say, you know, there's nothing amazingly special about those movies. They're kind of just fun movies for right. me. Like, yeah. they're just a fun escape to watch Keanu Reeves kill people. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and I don't think that every movie needs to be, like, a big blockbuster or, um, you know, like, amazingly written to be just a fun movie to watch. Because, I mean, mm-hmm. when it comes down to it, when you look at movies, they've always been considered, like, an escape for people. Yeah. So, you don't need a, a fight club to have a good movie. Yeah, yeah. But it doesn't take away from either one of them. Like, it doesn't take away from Fight Club being an amazing narrative-driven movie, and it doesn't take away from Star Wars being this fun space movie that does have narrative and plot to it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, kind of going off of that first point of, uh, like, that we were that we both went to the same uh, program at college and we both kind of aspired to be filmmakers, who are some of your uh, inspirations? Or, like, anyone from, like, a director, writer, editor, cinematographer, whatever, like, anyone that you kind of look at and are like, oh, that's an example of what I want to do. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm a big fan of Ted Hope. He uh, was the producer of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Okay. Um, he has a book called Hope for Film. 
mm. uh, that Professor Johnson recommended me and let me borrow from him, and I learned quite a bit from him in that book. Um, so I look up to him as someone who, not that I necessarily watch a lot of the movies he's produced, but that learning his background and the work that he puts in and how much he cares about producing films for people rather than, you know, there's that stereotype of what a producer is. Right. Um, so he was a big impact on when I started getting into potentially wanting to be a producer in the future. And then this is this one's a little bit surprising, but I'm actually a big fan of the special effects makeup teams in many movies. Mm. And it's I such mean, an under well, not like underappreciated, but it definitely doesn't unless you're like Weta or like Stan Winston Studios, you don't get nearly the amount of attention you deserve. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I I had done a, I had started kind of doing a lot of special effects makeup for student films while I've been at Kutztown because I you know I was one of the only people that know how to do it mm -hmm. um so I I ended up having a huge appreciation for a lot of pretty much like I don't I don't necessarily want to say there's no one in specific because the 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 makeup team for Guillermo del Toro movies are always amazing mm -hmm. I I don't even wouldn't even know where to start with the names because I I think that they're all amazing but I, I kind of want to give that shout out to to makeup artist teams because they they did inspire me to kind of end up getting more into film and understanding you know like that aspect I mean like I did makeup for one of the professor's um, films a couple years ago and I had to learn you know how to do makeup for a 4k camera because it's mm -hmm. not not how you every single you pore know. right yep. up in front of your face yeah <laughs> um and you know that one's that one's a little bit of an interesting one since I don't necessarily want to go in that direction anymore. Mm -hmm. But you know, I don't I do want to give, you know, the attention to the usual like, you know, like Quentin Tarantino kind of thing because they solely because they did pave a way for a lot of filmmakers and a lot of them did start out indie. Right. Um but I would say that Ted Hope is one of the bigger people for me just knowing so much about him now. Mhm. Mm Gosh, it's really tough. I'm also, I'm a big fan of, um, he was a cinematographer for Kill Bill. Let me see here. I think I might know who you're talking about, but I can't remember the name. Uh. It is, it's Robert Richardson. Okay. Um, I'm a big fan of him because, I mean, like I mentioned, he, I mean, he's usually Quentin Tarantino's cinematographer. He was a cinematographer for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood as well. Mm -hmm. um, I just said Kill Bill just because I love the cinematography in the movie definitely yeah it's it's one of the craziest movies from oh, a, sure. at least from a blocking like if, if you're only looking at the that the, what's it called the battle of the house of blue leaves like just from that yeah and that's the movie alone. i have in my head when i think of him is that right. whole that whole scene mm -hmm. is just insane um i i even i have to give a lot of a lot of appreciation for cinematographers um because as much as as much as they're appreciated in when you're in the film industry, I feel like everyone forgets about them. I, I have mm -hmm. a lot of appreciation for... I know it's not specific people, so I'm sorry. I'm, it's not exactly no, it's okay. what you were asking, okay. but I have a lot of appreciation for the roles that don't get a lot of recognition. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm an assistant director myself, and no one ever remembers what an assistant... No one thinks an assistant <laughs> director does anything in the first place. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I have a lot of appreciation for those roles that kind of just get stepped over whereas everyone's like the director mm -hmm. that's always the 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 number one like well actors are probably number one and then it's a director and then oh yep those are the only people who made that movie <laughs> yep <laughs> do you have any examples of because uh, you really touched on like special effects and cinematography are there any like movies that you think ha are like really excel in those areas but don't really get the respect that they deserve off the top of your head I want to say, I mean, this one, there was a time period, I feel like. And again, it's also hard looking at this from, you know, being in the film industry perspective because, you know, you have your friends that are all movie buffs. So mm -hmm. to, in your mind, it doesn't it doesn't exactly coincide. But um, I think Pan's Labyrinth excels so much in makeup. And there was a time period where it, of course, did get a lot of attention that it right. deserved. But that falls into one of those categories of, you know, I bring that movie up to people and they're like, well, 
if it's not dubbed, I don't want to watch it. Uh, yeah, I, I hate but that it's, so much. Yeah, and it's it's so worth watching. Like mm-hmm. the subtitles don't take away from it at all. It adds to it because that's what it was meant to be in. Exactly. Um, we kind of touched on this in the last episode. Uh, the our recommendations were Bong Joon Ho's Parasite and then Park Chan Wook's Old Boy, and it's just it, it frustrates me so much that you have these amazing movies that nobody is going to watch because they have to pay that just little extra bit of attention. It just that it, yes. I can't get over that. Yeah, I mean I've been seeing it all over the place of people asking like Amazon and stuff for returns on their rental for Parasite because they don't want to read it and it doesn't come in like a dubbed version. Right. And it's you know like I mean. We're, we're past the Oscars now. We know that it won, mm-hmm. and that's amazing. But it's it's still disheartening to know that it's still not getting the appreciation it deserves solely because it's a foreign film, exactly. essentially. Yeah. And I actually haven't gotten to see it yet. I'm actually watching it this week. I'm watching it um, this it's upcoming Thursday. It's an amazing experience. Um, I have it. I just haven't actually gotten to watch it yet. Mm. I've, I've, I'm so excited to watch it. And I was before I was here, I was talking to a bunch of people, and they all said that it was the best movie of 2019. And I mean, our praise for that movie aside, though. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, Pan's Labyrinth is definitely the movie that I first think of when I think about special effects makeup like that. Um, prosthetics are an insanely hard thing to do Mm -hmm. and that's I mean that's what that whole movie is basically Um, and when it comes to cinematography I mean the film Mandy's cinematography is amazing right um for me, I mean, I mean, bringing up Kill Bill and Mandy, I mean, you can see what what I think cinematography <laughs> is amazing. Mm-hmm. There's definitely cinematography besides that that's also amazing. I think the lighthouse was amazing. Yes, that definitely. I, I th- it, it really bummed me out that that was the only category that it was nominated for, and I was so rooting for it to get that. I don't even remember. Do you remember who got the cinematography award? I don't I remember. Don't, I don't remember. Um, it, it, I know, point being, it wasn't The Lighthouse, and that made me very mad. No, yeah, <laughs> but, and it, 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 had, it had upset me a lot that, you know, that's, mm-hmm. like you said, it was the only thing it was nominated for, whereas there was, you know, like 1917 and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Actually, no, that's what it was. It was, was 1917. It? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And not that those movies aren't deserving of awards, but they got so many nominations, and The mm-hmm. Lighthouse was definitely snubbed when it comes to that. And, you know, we've had this conversation before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, there's, there's just so many scenes in that movie that it almost looks like there wasn't a way for the cinematographer to just get that it looks edited of course it was but more than it you know what i mean it's just yeah yeah yeah. that that movie is absolutely insane to mm -hmm. me that's definitely one of those cases where they um it's not just like like in the case of 1917 like the the one shot aspect is very well the one shot aspect is very Mm -hmm. impressive but that's kind of really all that that movie has going for it whereas you have like with the lighthouse the the really strict aspect ratio and the really harsh lighting and the very specific brand of film that they were shooting on to get the different exposures that they were getting like it was very clear that that was meant to be a part of the experience and it's just one of those things where like the more you think about it the more uh the better it uh, gets yeah the better it gets the more impressive it gets right yeah but speaking of impressive cinematography and to sort of combine that with the the reason why i wanted to have you on uh my recommendation for you was uh, Jean Dielman, and I, I wish I had written down the name of the cinematographer for that movie, but that was a, a case of very, very beautiful and purposeful cinematography. Very simplistic, but it also like very, very impressive. And I, the one thing that kind of impresses me is that uh, when I was doing, and we can touch on this aspect more, but when I was reading about it after I saw the movie is that it had an 80% female crew, in a time where that just didn't happen. It was like mid-1970s. So I think that's impressive looking back on it, but it's almost kind of strange looking back on it because that's almost kind of a big deal still today. It definitely so is. So what, what is your take on the, the state of representation for women in the film industry uh, now versus what it was like back then? So, I mean, I, I did read up on that as well. I saw that... I mean, of course, you when you recommended that movie to me, you did mention that you know it was a female director, incredibly talented one at that. Mm-hmm. Um, I had 
done some research after I finished the movie and I'd seen that it was a mostly female crew and it was a big deal to me even being a woman and you're right it's it's a little bit sad that it's mm-hmm. a big deal now um in what well, that movie was 1975 75, I believe, yeah and it's 2020 now and that's still a big deal and it's definitely more common now to have uh I want to say like like uh, just generally more females on a crew um but I will say that in all of the projects I've worked on there's definitely a much larger number of males on the set than mm-hmm. females um and I believe we touched on that at the panel that you had attended with me and Celine yeah um and it's kind of even, you know, just in, in film school in general, there's definitely still more males. It's I would 100% say it's still a male-dominated industry. Why do you think that is? Because I think, like, when I look at other jobs and other walks of life, it is, it's not always 100% even, but it is, for the most part, like, around, like, a 50-50 or a 60-40 split. But you have, like, in this industry especially, like, there's so many, like, people could go on and on and on about all the directors they like, but then you ask them to name, like, five female directors, and I think most, most like, even now, like, I watch so many movies, and I can remember so many directors' names, but I'm hard-pressed to come up with, like, three or four. So, like, why do you think that is? That, because I, you, I don't think it's um, a stretch to say that they're, let me rephrase that, I don't think that there's, it, it, it's a, it's kind of ridiculous to say that like there are more men in it versus like the small amount of women. I think it is a much closer split, but we just don't hear about those women. Yes. I I definitely agree with that. That's you're right. That's a great point. I wouldn't, you're right. I wouldn't say that it's male dominated. It, I would say that it looks male dominated. Um, and I hate, I hate to say this, but this has, absolutely always been the case and again I believe I touched on this at that panel as well that women have always been considered the bossy people on a set and unfortunately you and I working in an industry that you can get blacklisted so easily word travels fast Um, and I'm actually I'm in a class right now where we're discussing how to brand yourself and you know, working on resumes, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's a, it's a communication design class. So technically a film major isn't like normally in the class. It's close. Yeah. But for that kind of thing, when we were writing our cover letters and everything, you had to write to someone specific. I had to go to the professor and I was kind of like, in this industry, you don't usually like apply to be an assistant director. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of like word travels, you get recommendations. I get people coming up to me and saying, like, I recommended you to this person. And that's great, but when it when it comes down to it, I think that has a lot to do with, you know, people going and saying, oh, she said this to me on set. She's just... That's be- it's just because she's a woman. Right. And unfortunately, that's happened to me many times on a set as well, because, I mean, when you're an assistant director, especially, like, you have to, you have, you have that driving force Mm -hmm. and, you know, things have to get done. So if I have to yell at someone, I'll yell at someone and that doesn't always get taken well. And, you know, it's, it's a tough split for me to figure out if it's worth it for me to kind of give up what I believe in to continue to have a job right it, it's tough to be like okay well i have to be do should i be acting like the nice person the nice sweet person that everyone wants me to be acting like just so i can continue to have a job or should i be sticking to my morals and also sticking to my skill set mm-hmm. and i found that personally you know i i get a lot of respect from people i feel like from sticking to my skill set because it gets the job done it gets the film done and acting the way that maybe they would prefer i act just doesn't get that done mm-hmm. and i think that that ends up being a huge issue on you know even on small sets on big sets it doesn't matter when it comes down to women working on it no matter what the position is if it it always has seemed like if they're not acting submissive then they don't have a job in the future and it, it's horrible 
really. Yeah, it definitely is. It's, it, it, it's, it, it, I didn't even, th- like, I kind of had some idea of it, but the point you touched on there is, like, if you have a bossy male director, like, that's just, that that's what a director is, but it's like you said, if you, the, the, the women just aren't looked at in the same lens of, like, equal power as a male director and that you're right it does oftentimes result in like oh don't work with them like it, it's it's so much of a headache but you don't even like with uh with someone like 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 kubrick for instance like he famously for the, with the, for the shining was very very harsh on like shelly duvall and jack nicholson shelly duvall especially to like d- like deliver such a specific performance to like the point of emotional and mental abuse but if like let's say um i can't like think of an um an example but like let's say that he if he was a a woman trying to get away with that like there's no way he would have been fired instantly so i like why do you think that is like why is why like and this is kind of even like from a broader perspective like almost like getting into the societal difference of why is it this way why do you think that there is that difference inherently I mean, that's that's definitely kind of a, it's a broader, not just based in film kind of thing, where, you know, it's, it's just that, I guess, men have always kind of just been looked at as that power figure that gets to have the last say, really. Um, when it comes down to it, I've worked with male directors or even people who were working under me that will 100% undermine what I'm saying. And, you know, I mean, I'm just saying, but when you're the assistant director, it might not be the best thing to to mess with the assistant director because they're mm-hmm. generally in charge of pretty much everything um, that they could possibly be in charge of. So I just think it comes down to people continue to follow that that men have always been the domineering like center of the family kind of thing and without them people seem to think that like a like you know a woman couldn't do the same job and I really I honestly I can't say why that is um it's when it comes down to it I think that it's still so apparent in 2020 because of the mob mentality Mm -hmm. and there still are there are still people today still men in like the bigger grand scheme of thing industry um who definitely aren't going to give that up anytime soon. And, you know, that comes into play with the Me Too movement and Harvey Weinstein. And there's just so many men in power that believe that they can do whatever they want to a woman or to whoever, and that there won't be a consequence. And it's just now starting in the last few years that those men are now getting their consequences. And that's not to say that, you know, there's, of course, not everybody's like that. There's just definitely those people that worsen the situation. It's just unfortunate that there's so many of them in that Mm -hmm. prominent role. Do you think that that's kind of like, I hate to say one of the plus sides of the, of the Me Too movement, but do you think that that's been like a positive uh, aspect of that movement where because we've become so focused on hearing uh women's awful experiences that we're now kind of retroactively like supporting them more because of that like i I don't know if that makes sense what i'm trying to say but like (laughs) like, so do you think that that is like a direct correlation or do you think that just is like two separate things that have kind of been happening concurrently no i i absolutely think that it it does have to do with that it definitely coincides i mean like I said, I, I had just watched Kill Bill recently because one of my best friends had never seen it. And mm. when we went and put on part two, I mean, my friend immediately went, oh, this is the part where Uma like hurt, got hurt and right. Harvey Weinstein didn't let her tell anyone for like, what, 15 years? Something like that, yeah. And didn't she have like permanent like damage permanent to her like damage, shoulder yeah. or something? Mm-hmm. Okay. And she, I believe it was right not long after the Me Too movement became so big, as she posted the footage on Instagram on mm-hmm. her Instagram page, um, and explained that you know she didn't talk to Quentin Tarantino for maybe I want to say eight years, mm-hmm. um, because she felt at the time like she couldn't forgive him for that. Right. Um, and ultimately, it was Weinstein saying like she, that he refused to give her the tape and that he didn't want her to go and even seek medical help because mm-hmm. he didn't want to get in trouble for it. And while 
that's not a situation of um, the typical Me Too movement um, explanation, it still speaks volumes to me and it still amazes me that that's that's what that scene's known for now. And while it's a grim reminder that that happened Mm -hmm. and it's unfortunate that that happened to her, I'm glad that it's something that people are talking about now. Um, Every time that that scene gets brought up, wherever, whatever location I'm in, that story gets brought up as well. And it's, it's definitely, it's how I said that it was the mob mentality. It's like a mob mentality fighting back now. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's definitely a, I think it's a good thing that it's, you know, being so open about those things now because it's it kind of coincides with you know in the 70s or the 80s or something a woman couldn't even you know talk about her body right and it was pretty condemned and now we're in a time period where that's changed so we can start making strides toward change within smaller areas such as the film industry and i think it's a a good uh thing that it's kind of started in such like a bit a public industry like i think movies it's arguably the biggest industry in the entire world because it's so universal. Uh, everything goes everywhere, and I think that it's definitely, um, it, regardless of whether you th- there is like a direct correlation or not, I think it's it's definitely great that uh, we're having that discussion now, and there, there's be, there's more there's more thoughts on uh, representation and including more people not even just women but just all all sorts of walks of life whether you're part of the lgbtq i don't remember the full acronym but that that community or like we had mentioned earlier bringing in more uh foreign language movies but one thing that i wanted to discuss and i I, we i talked about it with you a little bit on instagram when we were setting this up was you had shared a post where they were talking about the new... I don't even remember what it's called now because they changed the title, but It was um, Birds of Prey and the Fantabulous Emancipation <laughs> of A. Harley Quinn. Okay, so yeah, that new... the And I, for, for the record, I, I will say I'm more of a Marvel versus DC fan, so if anyone's going to say that that's part of the argument, fine, whatever. But the, the point that you were trying to make was uh, that you, you shared this image that it was an, an, an article that that movie hadn't done financially that well its opening weekend and someone shared that article saying that it was solely because of misogyny and how people are not going to see it because it's a movie about women in power and the point that you had made was maybe it's just not a good movie and I think that that's like it, it sounds kind of bad I think to say because no, it, 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 it has that it it definitely has that connotation of like inherently sounding like you're against progress but i think it's important to recognize that while more inclusion and the fact that we are having so much more in the way of representation it, it it's a good thing overall it's important to recognize that they there can be movies that are just as flawed as everything else and i think that it's kind of a toxic mentality to have that just we should accept everything regardless of its of its quality. I definitely... So, I mean, you had mentioned to me that, you know, that was part of why y- you seeing that post was part of what we wanted to talk about tonight. Mm-hmm. And I was actually pretty excited to talk about that because since we had discussed it and since I'd made that post, you know, I've seen a few other things here and there. Um, I had noticed that the movie has like pretty good reviews on um letterboxd and i think imdb as well Mm -hmm. and i was surprised because i mean i'll put it out there i didn't like suicide squad very much at all (laughs) like at all (laughs) um and i had mentioned on that post that i'm a huge fan of of harley quinn and i'll be honest i don't have a preference between dc and marvel Mm -hmm. um and that's just me but I had mentioned that I really appreciate Harley Quinn's character, so I was excited for Suicide Squad. I didn't hate the costume design, and that, that comes into play, mm. um, because I had seen quite a few people talking about how they hated her new costume for Birds of Prey, and I mean, I dabbled quite a bit in costume design when I was younger as well, and... I definitely see what everyone has been saying about how you can definitely tell that 
the costume in Suicide Squad was definitely geared for, a, like, the male gaze. Right. Um, Even whereas, down to the framing. I think I know yeah. which one you're talking mm-hmm. about, where it's, like, the two comparative yep. pictures, yeah. And then, um, in, you know, this new movie, she's got a pretty, pretty wild, wild outfit on. She cuts her hair off and everything, and I definitely agree that it looks like knowing her character pretty well it looks like something more like that she would wear Mm -hmm. um so i do definitely agree with that and i i thought a lot about it i saw a lot of people um discussing how they actually really liked the movie and i i also wrote on my post that i've not seen the movie so it was just my opinion is just that when i had watched the trailer i really wasn't excited for the movie Mm -hmm. um and I know that they changed it quite a bit from when they had first had even talked about making the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, That's kind of just been the trend with DC movies yeah. in general, I feel like. <laughs> Changing um, everything after they already have a plan. But it, it was very interesting because seeing all of these women and men giving it good reviews, it made me kind of consider wanting to see it, but I don't know if I would see it in the box office. Mm-hmm. Um. However, I still, at the moment, feel I do feel the same way that I do kind of think that in this case, it really might not be a misogyny. It might be a bad movie, and it could also be both. Right. Um, there's always that option that it could partly be that men are just saying that they don't like it. I didn't... I'm not 100% sure where they were pulling that information from. Yeah, well, I, I think there's definitely a truth to it just by the sheer virtue of the fact that comic book fans mm-hmm. are kind of that vitriolic anyway. But yeah. uh, I, I do think that that's definitely not the only reason why that movie didn't do well. Yeah, and I mean, I had just not really been looking forward to it mm-hmm. since the trailer came out and I watched it, and I don't even think I could get through it, if we're being honest. Um but I do think it's important that you don't just assume every single time that there is there has to be a reason why this movie did badly. Like, of course right. there is, because sometimes, though, it can just be that the movie wasn't made well, the movie wasn't written well, mm-hmm. kind of thing. But it is also important to understand when there is a reason and when this movie may have actually failed because of misogyny um, or because of something else. Um, but... Like I said, in this situation, I really think that this movie might have just been bad. But yeah. again, I haven't seen it, so... <laughs> no, well, neither. I don't have any plans to see it, just because I'm not really terribly invested in that universe. But I did see Suicide Squad, just because I heard it was really bad. And I wanted to experience it for myself. And I, I, I feel like it's probably... It, it, it has to be at least a little bit better, because I can't really imagine a movie being as bad as Suicide Squad was, but... Yeah, I mean, Suicide uh, Squad yeah. was a prime example of... Marvel is doing this, so <laughs> let's play catch-up. Yeah. I think it's also a... a pr- I had a conversation last night about this, that it's a prime example of bad representation. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, that movie... Just to touch on it a little bit, that movie went with some racial stereotypes, quite a lot of racial stereotypes, and I I remember when the movie had come out, there was a lot of uh, back and forth about the sexualization of Harley Quinn, and I didn't have a problem with it because it's part of her character. Right. Um, and it's it wasn't a big deal to me back then, and I mean, I saw the movie in theaters and at the moment I loved it and I mean when was that 2016 I was like maybe like 17 18 years old then Hmm. um I'd loved it and then I'd realized there's nothing to love about it Mm -hmm. um but looking back now and having that comparison of the Suicide Squad costume and the Birds of Prey costume now I'm seeing the big difference and why people had an issue with it back then. Right. Um, because it was definitely created for the male gaze, and that's something that many, many movies um, utilize is that male gaze. Mm-hmm. And it's one of those things that, that I'm, I'm glad we're having this discussion because without people sharing stuff like that, it's something that I don't even think about really because we're all, regardless of who you are, we're all kind of inherently locked into our own perspective, and I think it doesn't really help your experience if you're always constantly digesting 
art or anything creative through that same lens. I think it adds so much more to the experience when you can step back and think, how would this demographic think about it? How much would this person like the same thing or would they even like it at all? So it, it's definitely very helpful to have that. It definitely is. And I mean, you're right. Reading those articles and everything. I mean, a week, I want to say maybe I posted that about a week ago and in a week's time, I kind of ended up changing my mind in a way because mm. I, I was open to reading those other opinions and understanding it a little bit better. Right. One thing that you had said just a second ago that I kind of wanted to uh, go back to, um, another point that I thought was interesting in that, like the, it's almost like the flip side of, of saying that, uh, everything is is good and you shouldn't criticize it because it has this aspect going for it. One thing that kind of confused me, this has happened a, a couple times that I've seen, is that there will be like one or two movies that's like, yes, this is the model of representation that we're going for. And like the, one of the big ones I can I think of is the, uh, the 2016 Ghostbusters where they did the all-female remake and everyone was like, this is so great, women are being represented and it's awesome but the one thing that really confused me is when I would I saw the trailer and like you said the racial stereotypes and the the different stereotypes prevalent in Suicide Squad I kind of got like the same sort of vibe from like it just didn't look from like inherently it just didn't look like a very well written movie it didn't look that funny and people like whatever maybe it's just me and I and I, my tastes in comedy are differing from what that movie is trying to go for but what one thing that I I had a conversation with somebody about it at some point, and they were like, "Well, it's good because regardless of whether the movie is good or not, it's good because now this new generation of kids growing up with Ghostbusters will be able to see like, oh man, L Leslie Jones, I'm I'm a little black girl, and there's an older black woman who's in this like cool position." Well, and then I was like, "Well, but how is that like w that little kid is seeing?" Leslie Jones slapping Melissa McCarthy around going, hell no, demon, get out. And like, and I was like, that, like, how do you look at that and say that that is what you want to aspire to? And kind of going off of that, I was thinking of the other day, there was a movie that came out a few years ago. I really liked called uh, widows. Uh, it was directed by Steve McQueen, but it was a mostly female leading cast and nobody talked about that. And I thought that was very interesting because it, 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 it had a lot of really great performances. Uh, Viola Davis, Cynthia Erivo, Michelle Rodriguez. Um, there was one other woman, I forget her name. But it, the point being, there was a, a big leading cast of women. And it was, a, a, without spoiling too much about that movie, if you haven't seen it, it's a big message of that movie is we're women and we don't need men to get shit done. We're going to do we're on our own here we're going to prove that we're just as capable as the as these men but yet nobody talked about that and that could just be like the fact that like the way that it was distributed but i kind of think it's almost a shame that because the ip of ghostbusters is so popular people are like oh man like yes that that's what we that's what we want but then you're they ignore something that is as legitimately good or even better made do you have do you find that at all in that there that there's kind of like this blind like yeah that's good that's what we want and then there's kind of like almost this not like ignorance but like there's almost like ignoring like latching on to sort of one idea but ignoring no, other idea yeah. that was pr really rambling no no no, no, no no i totally <laughs> i totally know what you mean and it that that whole like that explanation was to me a perfect explanation of what is the difference between pandering and real representation? Right. Because yeah. that's, I Thank mean, I... Thank you for I, summarizing that in a coherent <laughs> way. That was terrible. Um, I, just did. <laughs> I mean, I didn't, I haven't seen either of those movies. Of course, I, I know about the Ghostbusters movie. I've, I feel like I might have, the, the way you explained it, I might have, I might have heard, have, may have heard of Widows before, mm -hmm. but, um, no, that's, it, that's always been a really important topic to me is, you know, trying to figure out, like, what, how do you fi figure out what the difference between pan, like, what's that fine line between pandering and real representation? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm trying to think of a movie, there's plenty of movies that are all just, they feel, when you're watching them, they feel like they're trying to pander to an audience that they don't know anything about. Right. Um, 
And maybe the Ghostbusters movie is like that. Maybe it's not. Again, I have not seen that one. I, neither have I. So, like, I, again, it could <laughs> just be an issue of it's not my brand of comedy, so I wouldn't like it. But it just seemed like, like you said, it just seemed like a very heavy instance of, like, we're jumping on this bandwagon and we know that this is this is the topic, this is the idea that's going to sell tickets at the time. So that, that's just how it seemed to me. I don't know. No, it's... it's I really wish that I could think of, a, of an example of a movie that panders, in my opinion. I've had this conversation so many times, but there's such a fine line just between watching a movie and feeling represented, whether it be from gender to sexuality, whatever it may be. There's just something so kind of interesting watching watching a movie that you feel like is pandering to your demographic and just knowing that they don't have any idea what that demographic even is really Mm -hmm. um i've definitely seen there's there's definitely plenty of movies that have accurate respective representation but there's also plenty of movies that just it just feels like a cash grab, essentially, that mm-hmm. they just want to capitalize off of a demographic that's trying to have their voices heard. Right. I guess what I was trying to say is, like, do you find that that pandering movie is better, is is more, fo- like, I guess not focused on, but, like, the, the, the movies that are pandering are almost more well-known than the movies that are trying to be genuine? Or do you think it's that's kind of a... Uh, I don't know, like a not true statement. I'm so bad <laughs> no, at hosting a podcast. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's definitely also an interesting one. Is I mean, in this, the explanation you just gave, I mean, yeah, that's a situation where the one that could feel like it's more of a pandering situation is definitely more well known. Like I said, I'm not a hundred percent sure that I have heard of widows, um, and. I think that it it can also go hand in hand with the whole there's a lot of female character like archetypes mm-hmm. that are in a lot of movies and even in the ones that sometimes will say that they're representing women end up just being the same old archetypes that are in every single movie. Right. Um but I don't know. I that's a tough one. I I kind of want to say yes. But at the same time, I'm not 100% sure. Like, there... I think that the the movies that pander to their audiences are... They're the kinds of movies that just... I mean, I guess you're right. They're the ones that... They're the ones that sell a lot of the time because of the fact that the people who are writing them know how to write for their audience, and they'll write it as a character that they think people are going to think is cool. Mm -hmm. Um, And maybe a character that's a little less cool, air quotes, ends up being the most realistic representation of a woman. And having a movie that has that cool character with all of the cool effects and the cool storyline compared to a real woman and how she would handle something... I'm going to say when it comes down to it, yeah, I would say that the pandering movie probably does get more recognition. Mm-hmm. And it's it's strange, too, because, like, the one, what I just thought of now is that, like, the in the pan, you can always kind of tell, because in the pandering movie, like, that's always apparent, like, in the marketing and in the, uh, like, in the movie, but, like, when they're trying to sell it to you, it's always, like, like in the Ghostbusters scenario, it's like, it's Ghostbusters, but hear these funny women this time instead of the uh, in the funny men but it's almost like there's there there i think the almost the best instances is when it's an afterthought of the representation like have you seen the movie annihilation i have not are you familiar with it yeah it's, uh, that's a all, that like almost exclusively all females in that movie except for oscar isaac i think he's like the only male figure but it took me like i saw watch that movie twice before i even thought about that so it's like it's it's I I don't know. It's I it's I think it's one of those scenarios where it's just like the vocal minority gets the most attention where and and that just kind of 
it it divides more because you'll you'll have those people that are like, oh, women aren't funny, women can't be good in movies, and you have the one group that's like, no, all women power, women power, but and like they're and they're touting something that's not good, and they're holding up this image that is just completely false in their heads. But then somewhere in the middle, as you have those movies like Annihilation or or Widows that go unappreciated, I guess it's like it's just lost in the in the noise in, instead of like. I don't know what I'm trying to say. It's, it's just like... It's almost like it gets lost in translation. Yeah. Yeah. I, I Again, you're doing a great job <laughs> of summarizing every incoherent point I'm trying to make. But, yeah, so I I don't know. I just... It's a... Uh, it's a... it's a We could go on forever, I feel like. But it's it's a very... Uh, it's a very important to talk topic to talk about. And I think it's great that uh, it is being talked about as much as it is. Definitely. And for everything I've said about... Uh, how I, I think the mainstream movies are kind of the ones that pander. I think that it is great because we're definitely seeing an emergence of uh, movies that don't, nece- at least from my perspective, my limited perspective, it, it, movies that don't pander and seem very genuine. And there's a lot of, uh, women, I mean, we wouldn't know from this year's Oscars, but there's a lot of women directors working today who um, are pushing that idea and 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 demonstrating i think more importantly for the future generations that like hey you can do whatever you want to do you don't have to have the like you said you don't have to have this worry of being blacklisted just because you're opinionated and you happen to have a different gender it's i it's i yeah it, it's, it's great it's definitely when it when it comes down to it in my experience the women that work in the film industry, whether they're directors or they're a gaffer or they work in audio, is a lot of them do just want representation of of women that just want what they want. Not these movies that, you know, the woman is sacrificing everything so someone else can be happy. Mm-hmm. Or these movies where everything was taken from them so they have to get revenge kind of thing where it's always the it's they're always put in a sad position always Mm -hmm. and you know there are movies like that that you know like kill bill where it's it's a she's in a powerful position and people respect her right uh her character and i mean her as well but (laughs) Mm -hmm. um it when it comes down to it me myself as an assistant director and a producer is I just don't want these movies where it's the same thing every time because mm-hmm. that's it's what it is is we're always put into these archetypes uh, whether it's a character in a movie or it's on set like I said of you know I've, I'm considered bossy and rude because I'm in a position of power mm-hmm. and I think that that kind of comes back to the whole limited perspective is that like a lot of times when you have a movie being made by someone who is not of that perspective that they're trying to to talk about like whether that be gender or race or ability versus disability whatever it it just it, it always comes across as one note because i think that's kind of just how we inherently see things and we and the people who have that perspective don't think that there's anything wrong with that and i think one of the good things about this movement is that it's saying hey there's not what you're what you're thinking isn't really wrong but there's more ways to think about it than it's the, not than so the black way we yeah. right yeah it's a topic that has a lot of dimension to it mm. um and it's we're in a time period now where people are starting to look at it as such and not something that's just flat and that's it right and I mean, like I said, we could go on forever. Oh, but yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like that's that's a good. Uh, I, I agree. In summation, what you've just said there. So, let, to tie it back to what I had said, at the, actually, are we still rolling on there? Yes, we are. So, to tie it back to what I had said at the beginning, uh, our, we're now into the movie recommendation portion of the show. Uh, I teased it at the end of last episode, but the movies we're going to be talking about today, I recommended Heather. I'm going to butcher this title so badly, but uh, Jean Dielman, 23, Kai du Commerce, 1080, Bruxelles. Is that right? My fiance speaks a little French, and she's looking at me <laughs> kind of mad. But, uh, yeah, so I recommended Heather that movie, and Heather recommended me Panos Cosmos' uh, Mandy. Kind of going with what we said about, like, the whole 
difference between today versus back then. It, it, well, not even the difference, the fact that it is so similar, but uh, it kind of... Well, I mean, I can see why this movie isn't necessarily talked about a lot, but I think that uh, movies like this are important, not even just from the fact that it's an impressive movie, but from the, fa- the, the fact that... that uh, from a, a young female director with an 80% uh, female crew talking about a uh, subject matter that just isn't ever really talked about in such excruciating detail in film. So, uh, before we get into spoilers, uh, Jean Dielman is a, is a French uh, film from 1975, directed by Chantal Ackerman, who I, I wish I was more familiar with her work. I know I can, I can think of some other titles she's done, but I, I think this is the only movie of hers that I can remember seeing. Uh, very prominent female director. Uh, this is kind of the movie that she's the most well-known for. Uh, and it's a film about a woman who's recently lost her husband, and it's just three days out of her life told almost in real time in, like I said, excruciating detail. And just, what did you think about this movie? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know where to, what else to say. I mean, so I mean, we, we talked about it a little bit before we started that, you know, I had mentioned to you, you, you look at the movie, you look at the runtime, it's, it's about three and a half hours, maybe a little bit less. Something like that, yeah. Um, and it's, it's intimidating. And you watch it, I have to admit, you watch it and you go... Yep, this is a French art film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but nonetheless, it doesn't make it a bad French art film. Um, I liked it quite a quite a lot. Um, mm. It was there's moments in the movie that are almost hard to watch, mm-hmm. not because they're visually hard to watch, just because you're right. There's an excruciating detail of watching this woman do just do her daily routine for three days. Mm -hmm. Um, and when you had recommended it to me, you know, I did a quick, like, Google search to see what it was and everything, and even the description, which basically says exactly what it is, still not what I had expected. Really? Um, And I had said this before as well, that this is a movie that while you're watching it, you don't think much of it, but once the movie's over, it just gets you thinking and you don't stop thinking about it. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's that's where I've been since I finished it. And I mean, I just finished it earlier today, but even even yesterday and the day before that, I believe when you'd given me the recommendation, I just kind of kept thinking about it because it's it's a brilliant brilliant movie, and it's a brilliant topic for her to have covered. Mm-hmm. It's yeah, and and going back to what you said about the excruciating detail, I did a little bit of research before and after, and there was one quote. I think she was kind of talking about her movies in general when she said this, but there was a quote from the director. She said, often when people come out of a good film, they would say that time flew without them no- without them noticing. What I want is to make people feel the passing of time, so I don't take two hours from their lives. They experience those two hours. And I think that's very, very true with this movie. And it's not like, I, know, I keep on saying, it's, it's all with, like, excruciating detail, and you, like, really see everything. It's not none of it is without purpose every it's all every single little detail in that movie is very very purposeful and whether it's informing you about what this woman's mental state is or uh just to show like this is that her her day or at the surface level is this is what her day-to-day is like every single thing in that movie is serving a bigger purpose and i think that's very impressive that that much thought was was given to something as like nuanced as there was a you know, behind the scenes clip i saw where uh chantel was like okay now when you fold the meatloaf you have to go back to front because this is why you're the, you you've you've grown, grown up doing this and this is how the, you've you've done it like it's just it's so impressive that like that much thought is going into something as simple as like here's how you prepare meatloaf <laughs> no yeah i mean what I, the perfect thing that i think about that movie is that while it's excruciating to for one thing it's also probably hard for us to watch something like that just being so used to a Mm -hmm. one to like maybe two and a half hour movie um and even if it's a if it's a three to four hour movie you're used to a lot more action than a woman's daily routine right but watching everything in almost real time like that puts you almost in her headspace Mm -hmm. of just this same routine every single day um 
and understanding where her mentality goes by the end of the movie. Right. Yeah. And it and it goes to a place that I wasn't necessarily expecting when I watched it, but it it, it does make sense when when you think back on it because the movie is kind of like it, it's not really shown, but it's kind of heavily implied that. Uh, the first day is a very normal routine and then by the time we get to the second and especially the third day like just little things have happened that have thrown off her entire routine you almost watch you watch her kind of decline into some I don't want to say like Like madness but it's some kind of madness that like a silent anxiety attack yes like it's it's something that you know you you drop the clean spoon and for us you just pick it up and you wash it again. Mm-hmm. But for someone who's had that routine for, I think, I believe that she's been widowed for six years. Something I think. like that, yeah. Um, six years of that same routine, for one thing, could drive a person crazy. Mm-hmm. And then something as minuscule yet powerful, just like dropping something, you you watch her just slowly begin to lose her grip. Exactly, yeah. And it's it's almost like, like the you said like the maddeningness of of living in a cycle but almost like what i took away from it kind of was the there is that sort of like maddening aspect of living in a cycle but i think for her she kind of the maddening aspect is when she's out of that cycle oh i know i agree yeah she uh i what i took from it was that like that her routine is her way of not dealing with her life and when she does have that little bit of free time because like that shop was closed and she has to find a way to kill an hour that's when she the self-reflection starts to set in and then that's kind of when everything goes downhill and it's again it's done so subtly but so beautifully at the same time it's it's written very well in that aspect like you just like you just said essentially Mm -hmm. but um very early on if you were to go and watch the movie again after watching it your first time, and I haven't done that, this is just something that I remember, but um, I want to say it's in the first, I believe it's in the first 45 minutes. I think the first 45 minutes is about the first day. Something like um, that. And when she sits down with her son and she starts reading the letter from her sister in um, Canada, she reads it out loud to him, but there are things that are so personal in that letter that she just reads so casually mm-hmm. and she's very dismissive right? Um, because her sister mentions how she, it's right at the end of the letter too, that she thinks that, you know, she should get remarried and that she thinks about her sister, be, like she thinks about um, her being single and cries for her. Right. Yeah. And her mother just, or not her mother, sorry. She reads that to her son so casually and then just folds the letter back up and puts it away and doesn't say anything. Yeah. Exactly. It's just, it's, it's so, it, it's very indicative of like, it's just lo- like little moments like that. Well, I mean, that's kind of like your big, probably only big exposition dump throughout that entire movie. Everything else is kind of like, just to serve the mundaneness, but like that's our one little bit of insight that we kind of get other than watching like the way she reacts to like, oh, uh, I, I, the potatoes are overcooked or, oh, I dropped the the spoon like that's all we really kind of get into her her character and it's like you said it's just it it says so much while presenting itself in a way that seems like it's so minimal like the fact that she's saying all this personal stuff or the fact that she's not letting this personal stuff affect it's like almost like she's reading off like a grocery list or something like that it's just it's so far removed it it's it i I, when I was watching it, it, it's definitely, it's a painful experience. But it's like you said, when you finish it, you're, you're glad that you did sit through it because it, it's very, very unique, and it's just it's subject matter that is not ever really talked about in that much detail or or spun in that sort of light. Yeah, and as I was watching it, I felt very, like, as I was watching it, I understood. I, at least I felt like I understood why everything was shot the way that it was and the way that it was written. And I understood kind of the, un, like, the point. I understood the point of the movie, I felt like. And then, you know, this, it happens at the end. And mm-hmm. your, your, I don't want to say your opinion changes, but it's just kind of like you really watched 
this woman struggle with something that she didn't even know she was struggling with Mm -hmm. and then kind of snap really right and i guess with that we can get in to i don't know there's probably not many people out there like oh i was waiting to watch that movie why'd you spoil it for me but it's uh we i guess we can get into the spoiler talk here a little bit Mm -hmm. with that ending one 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 thing that is a, a a big aspect of the movie is that she has essentially um, become, I don't want to say like a prostitute, but she's she's opened herself up to like men to call on her as a way of bringing in money to support herself. And it happens on each day that we see like a, a new man come in, they go to the bedroom and then cut to everything being over. I feel like in any other movie, we would have gone into the bedroom and we would have seen everything happen but it's not really ever like d- dwelled on until we get to that ending scene which we can come back to but one thing that right. i kind of liked that i thought was really inf- refreshing is that they don't dwell on that it is just kind of it's just it's you her see the door routine close, yeah. right it's her routine and this is just part of her day and uh it it just like it, it was refreshing i feel like cuz it 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 makes her feel it, it, it not it makes her feel, but it, for as when I was watching it, I, I I got the sense of like this is kind of another way of her assuming control over her own life. In 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 the in that I set my routine and this is what I'm doing. This is just another part of my day, and it's not exploitative. I feel like in any other hands, it would have just been like, okay, let's see what's in there because we have to see what's in there to put butts in seats, but. I don't know. It just that was one thing I thought was really cool is that they didn't dwell on it. No, I you know I agree with you. They I just focused, treated it normally. Yeah, I focused on that a lot as well because especially because you know the the way that the entire movie was written and shot is that you're almost in real time watching almost everything you do. I believe right after the first day, after the first man leaves, I think she takes a bath, mm-hmm. and you watch her take a bath. There is there is nudity in that scene. You watch her take a bath for almost six minutes I think something like that yeah and then immediately after that she gets dressed and you watch her clean the bathtub Mm -hmm. and that's essentially what the whole movie is is I mean there's a point where you genuinely watch her from start to finish make a whole meatloaf yeah Um, (laughs) um so it was it was definitely interesting to me that they you know she was showing her entire life except for that one part and for me when it comes down to even what we were talking about earlier with women, that um, in the 70s and 1975, and even up until, you know, not that many years ago... The height of, like, exploitation yeah, film. Even, even back then, you know, she was doing essentially what the general housewife is supposed to be doing, of, even though she didn't have a husband in this movie, and it's mm-hmm. brought up that she may not have even loved her husband. Right. Um... She, going off what you said, she literally, there's a line where she's talking to her son, and she's like, that's just what we were we supposed do. to yeah. do. Yeah. And she was like, I just wanted a kid. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and I think it's interesting that, I think it says a lot, and this is what stuck with me, that they were showing her day-to-day life of her doing these chores and doing and taking care of um, the baby uh, that she babysits and everything like that, but it almost makes me, and like that almost makes me think that the fact that they weren't exploiting her um, her everyday like routine with these men, it makes me almost think that it was her representation of saying this was such a taboo thing. Mm-hmm. Whereas in the seventies, it was you know pretty when it came to like housewives and everything, it was pretty it was pretty taboo for a woman to talk about her herself having sex, whether it's with her husband or not. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the same time, it wasn't quite as taboo for men right. at that time period. It's never been taboo yeah, for men. Yeah, never I'd really. Argue, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so that is a big part of what stuck with me in that movie is just that they were they were really representing the real life of a woman that could have been in the 70s that she couldn't talk about this even though it's the thing sustaining her Mm -hmm. and the fact that she is putting herself through that whether she necessarily wants to or not whichever one because they never really they insinuate that she doesn't necessarily want to want to do it but Mm -hmm. 
at the same time, you know, there are people that could want to do that. Yeah, and it's, I think for her, it's just a means to an end. It's just like, it's just another thing where it's like, I don't want to be alone with my thoughts from five to six, so what can I do? Well, I need money anyway, so like, let's do this. It's a way I don't have to deal with my life. And And it's, it's also very interesting that she had, she doesn't really, she doesn't speak to the men. Um, barely. Barely, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's... I will say there's not a ton of dialogue in the whole movie altogether anyway, compared to many other movies. Right. Um, like you said, the, I think the most dialogue in that movie is when she reads that letter. That letter, and I think maybe when her son is talking to her before he goes to bed. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's... Like, I mean, he the, the men come in the house, and she silently takes their jacket and their hats and everything puts them away and you see them go in the bedroom and shut the door and that's the almost one of the only things that you don't see in real time because the next thing you see is them opening the door and, coming right and back out. every single day except for the last day the man goes I'll see you next whatever day yeah. of the week it is right so you know you know you learn that it's a consistent routine for her that she does do this mm-hmm. almost every day if not every day since we're only seeing three days right so I guess let's talk about that because you mentioned it a little bit. But one thing that I kind of am still a little bit unsure about is that ending where, for just clarity's sake, over the course of the three days, we see day one, her very normal routine. Day two, uh, a few things are out of place. And then day three, think that she's kind of becoming a little unhinged. And ultimately, her um, her session with that man on the third day ends with almost the, well, the, well, we finally do see inside the room them having sex and it almost seems like whether it's because of her routine becoming unraveled or because of her self-reflection she's almost like regardless of whether she enjoyed it whether or not she enjoyed it before she's it seems like she's definitely not now and it ends with after it's over her killing the guy and then sitting quietly by herself. And one thing I was still kind of unsure about is, I guess, why? Why do you think that that's the way that her I, her expression came out, I guess? Yeah, I it was, it was quite the ending. And, I mean, when you think about it, in the grand scheme of three and a half hours, it's about 30 seconds in the yeah. whole movie, which says a, a lot that says a lot to me as well because she doesn't she she doesn't do it in a way that seems like she really wanted pain upon someone right it definitely doesn't seem like it was premeditated i think it was definitely a heat right, of the moment right. yes, thing definitely because it's like again it's just everything is like okay we, we use the scissors to open the package and we'll put the scissors back in the drawer oh wait i can't do that because he's here and I'm so off my thing, I'll just leave them here for now. I feel like it was definitely like, a, okay, this is what I have right here. Yeah, Let's do and this. I mean, something something big that I noticed about that scene is when she, after they're finished, she's sitting at her vanity where the scissors are. Mm-hmm. And the perspective is you're looking, I can't remember if, I believe you're looking at kind of the back of her head, but there's the mirror where you can see the man sitting behind her. Yeah. And he lays back, like, he grins or something, like a a smug grin, and, like, lays back on the bed. And there's, I mean, of course, this movie's no stranger to long takes, but Mm -hmm. she just stares at those scissors for at least 30 seconds with Mm -hmm. such disdain. And you can tell that she definitely thinks about it. It wasn't a heat of the moment. She just grabbed them and did it. She definitely thinks about it before she does it. And I do think that it's just this representation of both self-reflection and becoming unhinged mm-hmm. at the fact that her routine is falling apart. And I think she, it's almost like, you know, I mean, you're, you're, you're graduated now, but I'm also in a position and you were at one point too, where you're like, I don't know what am I going to do without school? Because that's, that's kind of all yeah, you've known. That's a good point. And that's where I think she was at in her mind where she was like, if if my routine's falling apart, what am I going to do after this? If my mm-hmm. routine, if I don't have my routine, what do I have kind mm-hmm. of thing? Because, I mean, essentially you have to think about the fact that 
generally she's been having this routine for about six years at least since her husband died um and six years is a long time to have a routine like that and i'm i'm sure that would drive someone to do a lot of things if they're really that worried like it it's honestly to me a good representation of anxiety if anything Mm -hmm. yeah and it's it's I, I still kind of I'm not entirely sure how I, I I do like that it's the movie is essentially like a long form this woman is becoming unhinged I'm st- I'm not entirely sure how exactly I feel about the ending still which is why I'm glad that like I for your insight right there but I that's not to say the ending detracted from the the experience of watching it I think it's a very powerful movie it's definitely very very hard to get through uh, I can't. I've only ever seen it the once, and I can't imagine trying to get through it again. But I do imagine that it is. It's going to be one of those scenarios where if I do, if I do ever decide to watch it again, it'll just be one of those picking up more details, Definitely. and the appreciation will only will only grow. Uh, so yeah, I that that was Jean Dielman. I think I I don't, haven't rated it officially on my IMDb, but I think I am feeling like an eight or eight out of ten, maybe even a nine. I don't know. I'd have to think about it a little bit more. I use, um, admittedly, I don't actually rate my stuff on IMDb usually. I usually rate it on Letterboxd. Okay. And yeah. they're, they're a five-star um, okay. rating. I was probably going to give it a three and a half to four stars okay. because I definitely, as much as I probably complained while watching it, I respect the movie so much and I think that it is definitely a great movie and I would recommend it to people but I'm probably not going to because I know they won't watch it exactly yeah it's one of those movies you you like you brag that you got through almost like a lot of my (laughs) friends that knew I was watching it when I was trying to kind of not spoil the end for them I was kind of like do you want me to just tell you because I know you're not gonna watch (laughs) it right right right. yeah yeah but it it, I think it's definitely if you can if you do have the patience to sit through it it, you definitely should it's an amazing experience uh, it like, makes you think in hindsight rather than while you're watching it. Mm-hmm. Like, like I said, I I'm gonna continue to thinking to think about that movie. Yeah, it's I, in summation, it's painful, but it's worth it. So uh, that kind of leads us into our next, uh, the other recommendation, the one that Heather recommended to me. I can't think of a movie further than <laughs> she and Dealman, <laughs> but uh, it was what year did it? It was 2018, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. 2018's uh, Mandy, directed by Panos Cosmatos. I think that's how you say his name. Uh, which, goddamn, <laughs> what a what a movie! That, that, Honestly, that's yeah. that might be that might be all you need to say about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, end of end of show. Yeah, but it uh, yeah I watched it um, last night. Uh, I was I, I was already familiar with the director's only done two movies, uh, this and then I think in two thousand ten he did a, a movie called Beyond the Black Rainbow. Are you familiar with that one? I haven't watched it but I'm familiar with it, yes. It's I I, I kinda uh, at the time I really, really liked that one, but in in hindsight it's kind of a, a scenario where it's a lot of style and not a lot of sustenance yeah exactly it's a lot of look how impressive these visuals are and we have a very bare bones story so while i loved his his visual style from that movie and i I was excited to see what he would make next i was kind of worried that it would be like the same thing of like it's not a lot of plot and we're really leaning on our visuals here and he definitely leans a lot on his visuals here and the plot i would I, i i think it's pretty fair to say it is a very like simple plot but it doesn't i don't think it leaves anything to be desired it tells you exactly what it's going to be and it delivers on exactly what it's going to be in a very satisfying way and to boot it's one of the most beautiful movies i can think of it's 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 amazing what are you, what it, what does that movie mean to you i guess so i mean for, I mean, a little bit of a kind of a funny backstory is um, it's one of my best friends, like one of his favorite movies, um, and he watched it not long after it came out. Um, so I watched it maybe a year and a half ago mm. around there. Um, the first time I watched it, I couldn't talk the whole movie because <laughs> 
I think I remember I had started talking in the beginning and then it kind of caught me and the whole time I just kind of sat there with my mouth open <laughs> at what I was watching. Mm-hmm. Um, it's You're right, it's a pretty straightforward movie. Um, and when you kind of dumb down and think about the plot, it's very, very simple. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's honestly, if you looked not too hard, been done before. Mm-hmm. But I think that he did a really good twist not a twist, but just very his different. Spin on it. Yeah, yeah, his own his own style of it. But the movie means to me is just I mean, like I said, the it's the visuals are absolutely crazy, um, and I also think that the acting in the movie is great. I mean, I'll I, I'll be honest, I you know you hear that Nicolas Cage is in a movie and you're like that, I'm All already right. sold yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I already want to see it I don't care what it is and like you know this was a new kind of character for him to play mm-hmm. um, and he played it like like I couldn't think of a better person to play this character mm-hmm. um, I mean going into it and watching it it was very it was something different for me at the time and it's become some of my favorite type of movies to watch now kind I wouldn't I'm not even sure what you can really describe that movie as I mean when I was again when I was talking to my friends about the movie you had recommended me I had said I was like I got recommended a movie that was you know a real time of a woman just you know living her life whereas you got got recommended LSD revenge (laughs) story (laughs) exactly um and I had said that I wanted to talk about the movie because I think that it deserves more exposure as well as it's just such an interesting movie and I had told you I'd, I've done an analysis of the movie before to kind of understand why he made some of the decisions he did because he did write that movie as well. Mm-hmm. Like he wrote and directed that movie. Um, and it does kind of play into what we were talking about with women in film which this is women literally in film as um mandy the main not well not the main character actually and the that's, that's something interesting yeah. about it um mandy ends up kind of being a representation of a very strong character mm-hmm. um and if you really think about it she's one of those situations where something that seems so minuscule ends up actually being the root of everything that happens in the movie right yeah, the movie doesn't happen without her. And it's a very... It's kind of like a damsel in distress, but there's no reward of saving that da- the damsel kind of by the end. They they kind of... They, they quell that um, stereotype pretty early on. I won't spoil it yet, but it's very... Um, it's, it's a revenge story done very simply and very beautifully and like you said it is very much about this uh this woman who is so integral to the main character's life and just kind of like the the i I think when you boil it down it's really like two little things that she does that kind of sets the whole thing in motion she makes eye contact with the crazy uh charles manson stand-in and then ultimately <laughs> does the something that he doesn't like and yep. <laughs> then that sets the whole the whole snowball rolling yeah. down the hill but it's it yeah it's i i mean she's also a very interesting character yeah even though from the limited time that yeah, we do the, get the, with the her the small amount of time that you actually interact with her while she's on screen speaks volumes about her character um pretty early on when the 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 one time where I would say she speaks the most is when she's telling Nicholas Cage's character Red the story about when she was little and her dad killed all of these baby starlings with a crowbar right in front of her. Mm-hmm. And you know, I mean, you her character. I mean, you look at her and she has that big scar and her eye um, is a little bit. I can't remember if it's a different color or if it's actually, like, her eye. There's I, something maybe medically wrong with yeah, her eye. Yeah, I, I don't remember exactly either. But, I mean, she has a very interesting look to her that the scar on her face is never addressed. Mm-hmm. It's just there because... And I think that's an interesting choice that he made to never bring that scar up. Right. Because, I mean, 
they give you the explanation that she may have had a, a messed up childhood mm-hmm. that maybe relates to that scar, but maybe it doesn't. Yeah, and um, I think that kind of goes hand in hand with the both of them. It's because mm-hmm. they you don't really know anything about Nicolas Cage or Mandy, uh, but a lot of their backstory is kind of implied through like looking at what's around their house together or like you said seeing that scar on her face and even the fact that they just live smack in the middle of the woods with almost little to nothing around them Mm -hmm. and you know he brings up potentially wanting to move and she doesn't want to um she's just a very interesting character for the short amount of time you really kind of get to know her without really knowing anything about her at the same time yeah and it's very interesting uh and even though she's the title character, I, th- I do feel like, as with almost any movie he's in, Nicolas Cage kind of steals the show. Definitely. He's, he's over the top and crazy like he almost always is, but in a way that fits and doesn't feel out of place, I feel like. It's it's that his sort of intense yelling and screaming and crying delivery really fits well with everything that he's supposed to be experiencing, and he doesn't really have a whole lot of dialogue it, which no, was very impressive. It's a lot of him mugging to the camera. It's a lot of him watching awful things happening. And it's just, it's a he's new a very, level of performance he, and, from him. Yeah, he's he's an amazing actor. That The scene after essentially one of the biggest plot points of the whole movie takes place is when he's in the bathroom with the bottle of vodka and just starts crying, screaming yeah. and crying and just like grunting because he's just it's it's the only way he can let out his current emotions without just i mean he really did just completely break down yeah. and that's what i love about that is that there was no him trying to look like this cool macho man which goes hand in hand with something with like other parts of the movie um, without spoiling that yet. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one of my favorite, because essentially it's also a beautiful scene because of how they designed the house. It's a yeah. very interesting house. Yeah. And it's a very, like, the bathroom looks very, like, 70s. It's whoever did the um, the set design for that room in specific did an amazing job. There's the, the wallpaper, and there's also... Um, I believe it's it's Mandy's like nightgown is like hanging on the like the shelf or something mm-hmm. and he's just standing there in her shirt and his underwear just screaming and drinking from the bottle. Right. It's it's very powerful. And I, I guess that we can take that as our cue where if you yep. haven't seen Mandy, uh, we're gonna about to spoil it. Uh, but I def- definitely recommend it. It's it's a fun two hours to, to spend and it's not for everybody if you're not really into horror and I guess gore blood, in some ways. There's, then, there's definitely quite a quite a bit of blood in this movie. Yeah, it's probably not for you. If you can't watch a Tarantino, you can't watch this. <laughs> perfect, perfect way to sum it up. So, yeah, it's it, the whole movie is really about his revenge for these cult leaders killing his girlfriend because <laughs> the cult leader is like, okay, here I am. I am. I. I, I am this godly man and I am presenting myself to you and she laughs at him and then everything goes to hell but that was uh, that sequence um, the, uh, almost every single sequence in this movie where someone's tripping or on some type of drug is so visually not just interesting but it's it's horrific in its own strange way where it just ma- it makes you feel so uncomfortable like yeah. just by use of its use of color and maybe a little bit of distorted audio and I think that's one thing that this director does very well because there was a lot of that in Beyond the Black Rainbow they're both sort of um, trippy horror movies but it, in, in very different ways so I think that this movie definitely highlights his strengths in that area uh, very very well and I, that whole stretch from when they when they dose her up until when they ultimately kill her in front of Nicolas Cage, I think is one of the most intense sequences I've seen in a movie in a while. It, it's very, very out there. Yeah, it's... I mean, the thing is, is, you know, when you're... When you think about the movie, you think, you know, like, oh, she, she laughs at them and that's the snowball is... 
when for me when I did the analysis of the movie something I I really noticed is you know how how big of an impact just her laughing at him is essentially I mean Mm -hmm. what happens is um this cult leader um I've been trying to figure out his name I can't remember him uh Uh, Jeremiah Jeremiah, yeah yeah. um but I think a lot of times they end up calling him Sand as well because it's his Mm -hmm. last name so either one but uh Jeremiah they're on like some sort of bus I guess going back to their their kind of camp or or, like home base for the cult and he sees her walking I guess she's walking to work or she's just taking a walk or something and they make eye contact Mm -hmm. um and he demands to his entire cult that he needs her Mm -hmm. and they they go to Red and Mandy's house actually no they don't they kind of make a deal with this biker Gang. biker gang that almost seems paranormal in some way that's mm-hmm. never exactly explained that they make this kind of deal where I guess I mean this movie is very much so a lot of acid there's a lot of LSD in this movie mm-hmm. um, and they make some kind of deal and the bikers go and um, they kidnap them and they like you said they dose Mandy with some sort of hallucinogenic whether it's LSD or not um, and they force her into this room with Jeremiah who's kind of covered in his followers on all over him mm-hmm. and he you know he kind of gives her this spiel about how he used to be a musician and he failed and he um, was told by someone that he is God and that he everything he sees is his and he has the right to take it mm-hmm. and that that's how he feels about her and you know she's she's very much so tripping so it's it's even amazing to me that they have her character this make these decisions in the state she's in and mm-hmm. you know she she asks him if the music he's playing is him and when he proudly says yes he he uh, exposes himself to her mm-hmm. and she laughs at him um after he explains that you know she can kind of be his queen in a sense right. kind of rule with him and she laughs at him like uncontrollably and the the editing in there is very it's it's a very interesting scene um and it's a monumental scene because that's this is what we've been talking about that snowballs the rest of the movie because essentially he 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 forces red to watch as they burn mandy's body alive in front of everyone um and something i want to bring up that i think will be a little important later is right after she laughs at him they actually go and see red who's tied up on like a wall or a post or something Mm -hmm. and he says something along the lines of like you think you know what love is or something like that Mm -hmm. and he forces one of his followers who he's been having a lot of sex with um and is definitely underage that um he's gonna show him what love is and forces the girl to put a gun to her head and pull the trigger and in this scenario there's nothing in it and she's okay Mm -hmm. but watching it you know watching how crazy jeremiah is you really have no idea if there's going to be something in there or not exactly yeah it's Um, the vibe that i got was like this is uh the ultimate nice guy bad guy you know what i mean (laughs) <laughs> like, no, that's that's actually where I kind of was going to go with that because I did read that when he wrote the character of Jeremiah, he wanted him to be the embodiment of toxic masculinity. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what Jeremiah is. And that's kind of why this is part of why I also wanted you to watch this because while maybe watching Mandy from the surface view, it doesn't seem like it doesn't seem like Mandy's laughing at him as much besides a slap in the face to him. And that's, right. you know, why he does what he does. As you continue to watch the movie, um, there's actually a lot of, like, kind of references to him being just the embodiment of toxic masculinity. Because, I mean, he, for starters, I mean, he's calling this woman's body his own just because he wants to. Um, And another thing is when you kind of look at the characters of Jeremiah and you look at at Nicolas Cage's character, Red... It's almost as if Jeremiah wants to be what Red is. Um, Because Red, you know, like we just said, he he really shows his emotions in this movie. Mm -hmm. He cries, he screams, but he's also an incredibly angry 
and vengeful man at the same time. Um, whereas Jeremiah never really, you know, at the end when Red finally does see Jeremiah for the last few minutes of the film, he pleads with him. And exactly. suddenly, yeah. suddenly, he's not the big man that he thought he was mm -hmm. when he was lighting Mandy on fire because he was in control then. Right. It's all about this just power play. And I, that's, I didn't even think about that until, like, just now that it is kind of like... It, it didn't, at, on surface level, it doesn't really quite go with the theme of, like, what we've talked about before and the theme with the other movie, but in the same time, it's almost like the reverse. It's not so much analyzing uh, women in film and representation, it's analyzing the negative aspects of the of men in film and how how certain characters are portrayed. And it, it is, like, like I said, the ultimate kind of, like... <laughs> this is this is the mentality of a lot of people out there and it's kind of like you think of it as harmless but like <laughs> this is where it can go when it goes to the extreme v very interesting movie if, from the uh, surface level alone it's a great revenge story a very great horror movie actually I, I don't even know that I would necessarily call it a horror movie I would kind of call it like a very intense action movie almost like like it's a it's kill it, it, it's kill bill with a little twinge of horror in there but definitely not quite there but it it's yeah it, but beyond that it has a bunch of very interesting themes that say a lot about what it is to be a man and the negative aspects of of when you have a a twisted worldview gone too far or when yeah it's just Especially, it, yeah, they they try to they try to itemize Mandy. Essentially, they they don't. The whole thing to them is that they're ju it's, she's just another object that Jeremiah wants, and that's part again part of why I wanted to bring it up. Have you even have you watch it in general? Because from the surface, no, it definitely doesn't have any. It seems like it doesn't have anything to do with what we've been talking about tonight, but. It really does. When it, yeah, when it comes down to it, his character was specifically written to be the perfect explanation of toxic masculinity. And he, like, the director had also written it so that, essentially, so that the director could get revenge on that toxic masculinity, even though it's a movie for mm -hmm. them. Um, because, I mean, the... You're right. It's definitely thinking about that now. It's definitely like Kill Bill, but a little bit different. It's it's full of cool weapons and violence and mm -hmm. everything. And even the dialogue in the movies. Uh, I mean, I think the dialogue is pretty good because I mean, when he when he goes to that trailer to get the weapon, he his whole little monologue about calling them like weird hippie like crazy evil yeah his i mean his delivery of it as well like makes the movie in itself but i mean overall just the the i think the movie's beautiful there's Definitely. been many times a lot of times in student films um <laughs> Where, you know, there's kind of that misuse of the reds and the purples just because mm -hmm. you get a little gel happy and you want to you wanna make, make an experimental movie and you exactly. try it. Exactly, yeah. Um, which is awesome to try that stuff out, but sometimes it just doesn't work for certain themes and certain movies. And this is one mm -hmm. of those movies where I couldn't imagine it any other way than the way that it is shot. Exactly. It really it uses that color to really, not only just in the trippy drug sequences, but it, it really uses its... It's such like heavy saturation to kind of accentuate and really put you in that environment like when I like it's probably like a weird synesthesia thing but like when I was watching it and he's like in that scene where he goes to his friend to get the crossbow and you see like it's a hot day in the in the woods and all that you like feel the like the heat in the air and you feel like the just that environment it really it, like it, it's a weird kind of like it physically puts you in there and like the nighttime scenes where he's driving through the woods and all you have is like the red backlights and the orange headlights lighting everything up it, it makes you it like it, it creates such a harsh contrast with the shadows that it, it makes it, even if you didn't have any music or you only saw that driving sequence it would make you think oh man this is scary yeah it, i mean like plus 
it's almost it's almost the opposite of um of your recommendation in I mean it is but mm. in that um when I mean Nicolas Cage's character is a very down to earth man he's kind of like a woodsman I think he works in construction they reveal right in the beginning of I think the he's movie. like a logger or something yeah something yeah. like that yeah um and as you know when he loses Mandy he um, immediately is unhinged by all of the screaming and the the vodka and everything but there's there is the scene where after he kills a lot of the the bikers he dips his finger into the LSD or maybe it's not LSD right. whatever it is it's implied that it's LSD mm-hmm. um and he just dips his one finger into it and tries it and there is this whole nightmare insane <laughs> nightmare sequence with like the melting face and everything mm-hmm. um and later on after that you know right at the end of the movie after all is said and done there's it's probably become the most iconic thing from the movie is the scene where he's driving and he looks in his passenger seat and sees Mandy there, there, she there. Is, yeah. and then it cuts back to him with that unhinged grin mm-hmm. completely covered in blood just an absolutely terrifying like you look at this man and you know that something's happened that it's right. made him this way and you kind of know from that moment that no matter what happens it's not really going to be a happy ending so yeah, it's almost was, sad yeah. in that he's gotten his revenge but it's like it doesn't it didn't it didn't do matter anything. right yeah and it's just yeah that that scene especially i i think of like as from the, not just the aspect of like oh man that's a great use of color to illustrate something unsettling but it's just the whole movie in general uh like i said at any given point the, their use of color is fantastic but really ramps up in that second half of uh going really intense what like you there's there, there is a, there's a very clear it's it's not just like you said it's not just throwing on a gel on a light for the sake of having a gel it's all very purposeful like in that scene when he, she's talking about the starlings it's very like blue and green and muted and it's very peaceful and then when you have those scenes with like the cultists and when he's forging his weapons and all that we have like the much harsher reds and the more contrast and it it's it, it, like we had mentioned with the lighthouse it's it's so purposeful and it, it it and because of that it really sticks out in your mind the music too it's all it, 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 you have like very nice sort of like synth melodies of the early 80s in the beginning but then we kind of get to like droning feedback noise by the end of it to just really like unsettle you and make you uncomfortable this yeah the soundtrack of that movie is amazing um they they have some king crimson in that movie Mm -hmm. um and i i don't i couldn't imagine that movie having anything but the songs that it does have um and i mean you you mentioned you know kind of like the second part of the movie and i mean they do kind of break it up um because i i can't remember 100 percent, but they don't actually bring up the title of the movie until maybe after the death after the death yeah Yeah. i think that's when they kind of break it up into parts is after mandy dies they bring up just the logo Mm -hmm. of mandy which kind of looks like a like a metal band logo kind of thing yeah um and it's definitely there there's certain movies that you watch and it kind of feels like they're in two parts like for me like full metal jacket mm-hmm. that part that movie feels like it's in two parts for me yeah um, almost two movies yeah it's like two different back. movies yeah. yeah and that's M- mandy feels that way for me but at the same time doesn't because i feel like they could have made something alone just out of mandy's death that's it right but the second part would have flopped without the first part of it Mm -hmm. so i just kind of i do appreciate the way that they went about kind of wanting to give that background and then kind of making it into a part two if that makes sense yeah no i get you yeah that uh it definitely does make sense but i i think that it it did it definitely it, it does feel like two very distinct movies but it I feel like they do flow together definitely so definitely. well. It's it's very like like you said with Full Metal Jacket. I could easily turn off the movie after the the training camp sequence mm-hmm. and feel satisfied, or I could start it from that scene with the two of them outside and the prostitute and and get just as fulfilling an experience yeah, watching exactly. either half. But I, I you really can't have I, by sheer virtue of the plot. But I but I think that 
like you said, they're very different, but they are a part of a whole in a in a great way. For sure. So I guess yeah. On that note, that uh, I I really liked Mandy. Uh, probably I think I am, I'm feeling like a seven, maybe an eight out of ten. Uh, I, I I like I said I, I I'm a big fan of Panos's work, and I I want to see what he's gonna make next. I I wish that he didn't have these big seven year gaps in between his movies but whatever he makes next i'm going to be really excited for if purely by visual stimuli oh yeah i definitely agree i i just checked i gave it a five star review on um letterboxd and you know that's that's i mean that's also a biased opinion that like i said (laughs) i do love i do love the movie i recommended it um i do think it deserves i i would definitely give it a watch i'd recommend it to anyone like that isn't squeamish um Mm -hmm. because there's definitely a lot of it's a very graphic movie, yeah. for sure. I would say that it does... Sometimes I, I, I did feel like that got in the way a little bit for me, and I guess to kind of justify why I, I'm not... like I'm not like People can think whatever they want, but for me, anyway, some of the drawbacks were... I, I do like that it flowed together so well, but I do think the pacing in that first half is maybe a little bit too slow at times, and they, they do kind of get lost in, like, making it as intense as it is and that's kind of where it loses points for me in some areas but at the same time i I think i do kind of have to recognize that it's that that's just a a subjectivity thing and less of like like i I don't feel like the he was ever being too over the top i feel like I, i feel like you could watch this and if this is your thing you would be fine with it i feel like it's more of a me issue than a a film issue yeah and i mean no definitely and i mean having having watched it like a few times now um i don't want to say that it changes but kind of that that slowness of like the first half um where you you get that backstory of their relationship kind of and what they're doing and then everything leading up to her death Mm -hmm. um it almost feels it almost feels faster when you watch it a, a few more times right maybe because you know what's coming because really, I think it's, I think it's like forty five minutes in until she dies. Like I it's, think it's, it's almost a, exactly halfway. It's, it's like yeah, a pretty like much a two hour movie, and then close to that point, like you said, yeah. Like I actually discovered that today when I was watching it because I, I had just gotten curious and I just kind of checked to see what we were at when she was, um, when she was dying, and I was kind of amazed because I had just never noticed that before. Mm. And it's kind of a brilliant, it's a brilliant thing for them to do in order for it to essentially feel like there's two parts to the movie right and yeah it's like we said it's two very distinct parts but it it just make the both of them together make a whole i think very very well and it's it's definitely worth a watch i think both of them i think both of our recommendations are definitely worth a a watch they're both vastly different from each other Mm -hmm. but um, but in a weird way kind of communicating similar Yes, absolutely. Well, not similar points, but there are two parts, like like Mandy, it's two parts of a whole communicating a bigger, broader message that needs to be talked about. Definitely. So, on that note, uh, thank you guys for watching the Watchlist Podcast. I've had a lot of fun. Heather, thank you so much for coming yeah, on. I think I, I had a great time talking all these different issues and different movies with you. Uh, tune in next time we're gonna have my friend emily pavlich on uh we're gonna make it a little bit lighthearted than this episode we'll be talking about disney pixar is brave and i forget the name of this i think it's studio canals uh the secret of kells so two kids movies it'll be fun to talk about and again thank you guys for watching the watch this podcast heather thank you for being on thank you and we'll see you next time